It is good to see some of you back. A lot of you were gone the last couple of weeks for Thanksgiving break, and I pray that you had a good time and ate some really good food. Um, I don't know about you, but Thanksgiving Day is one of those days where I lose all constraint, and um, I enjoy my Thanksgiving meal. I eat, and then I eat some more, and then I end up eating some more, and pretty soon, at the end of the day, I'm like, fatty McButter pants and just um, ready to um, just fall over and just fall asleep or do whatever. Before you know, I'm just eating and eating and eating. And the idea that if a little is good, then more is better. Then a lot is the best. See, that's what we think, isn't it? A little is good. And if that little is good, then... A little bit more is better, but then if we can get a lot of it, that's the best. And what gets us there? What gets us to this idea that if I can just get a little bit more, I'm content? If I can get a little bit more, I'll be satisfied. You know what the most amazing thing about Thanksgiving Day is? In about three hours after you eat, you're hungry again. You're starving just a few hours after you eat, and then you have this lingering sense of regret. What was I thinking? What was I doing? And it's not just about food. Some of you guys play video games, and you're up late at night and just saying, one more game, just one more game. And all of a sudden, it's like 3 in the morning, and you're finally putting your head down, and the alarm clock goes off at like 7 or 8, and you're like, what was I thinking? What was I doing? Some of you are Facebooking for like three, four hours, and your entire afternoon is gone, and you're at work, and you look up, and your boss sees you, and what's he thinking now? Um, what is he wondering about? And some of you um, might binge exercise. You go hours and hours on exercise, and what in the world are you thinking? Um, and some of us um, spend more on things that will not satisfy us. And then we open up our credit card statements in January, and what was I thinking? What was I doing? And so I'm not your nanny this morning, and I'm not your parent. I'm not your accountant, even though that's my profession, and I'm not your trainer. But I think for a lot of you guys, I am your pastor. And so I'm going to ask you to do something with me. I'm going to invite you to conspire with me. I know you've been taught in church that you're not supposed to be a rebel, but I'm going to go against that this morning and say, bring out your inner rebel a little bit. Let's be a little rebellious because this topic this morning matters to you. It matters to God, and it's actually in the original Christmas story. And let me invite you into a conspiracy this morning. Last week when we began this series, someone came up to me after service and said, Conspiracy? That's not the word I normally think about when I think about Christmas. Because normally, what comes to your mind when you think about conspiracy? What's the word that comes immediately after conspiracy? Conspiracy theory, right? And what do you think about when you've heard about those conspiracy theories? What's the next word that comes to your mind? Nut job, right? Nutcase. These guys are nuts. They're, that's the word that comes to mind because they're going to tell you how the crop fields... Um, crop circles are really there or who the Illuminati are or they're going to talk to you about the grassy knoll or how we never landed on the moon. Listen to me, just because you're part of a conspiracy doesn't mean that you have to be cocoa for cuckoo puffs. Cocoa puffs. You're not a nut job. Cuckoo puffs, sorry. A conspiracy by definition is a gathering of a group of people who are conspiring together people who are planning together to rebel against or overturn the powers that be. And last week when we began this series, we began to talk about how this season God is calling us to worship fully. That this is season is about Jesus. It's not about stuff, even though stuff matters. It's about Jesus. And in the midst of all of our busyness, if we forget that this season is about Jesus, then we've missed out on the meaning of Christmas. That every character in the Christmas story responded in worship toward Jesus in different ways when they encountered Jesus. 
And when you encounter Jesus, it compels you to worship. See, part of what we do here, when we come together and we say things together and we sing songs together, we do that because it's about Jesus. It's about him and only him. This week, we're going to jump into something very interesting. We're going to be talking about the topic of spending less. And I'm not going to be passing out an offering basket. We've already done that. I'm not going to try to guilt trip you. But we want to say that if the story of Jesus actually is true, how does that affect the way that I live during Christmas season? So as I begin, I want to do an exercise. And I normally don't do this. So you're going to have to work with me. Um, And this is going to be completely uncomfortable for you. And it's going to be challenging, but bear with me for a second. I want you to take out your wallet or your purse and put it on your lap. Take out your wallet and purse, put it on your lap. If you're walking in, you've got to give offering. I'm just, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> take out your wallet, purse, put it on your lap. I'm not going to ask you to show me how much money is in there or what you have or don't have. Put it on your lap for one second. It's going to get really uncomfortable for you here right now. What I want you to do is I want you to take your wallet and I want you to give it to someone around you. Preferably not someone who's in your family. Give it to someone who's a stranger. All right. Now, those of you who got someone else's wallet, please don't open that up. Please don't take out credit cards or cash or your lunch money for today after service. Let's not do any of that. Um, everyone else pass it around? You guys pass it around? As you hold on to someone else's wallet and you know that your wallet is in someone else's hand, how does that make you feel? How does that, how does that make you feel? See my wallet? I've got my driver's license in here. That's a bit of my identity. So if you are holding my wallet, and this is why I'm up here and you're down there, um, because you don't have my wallet, you would have my identity, a part of me. I've got a little bit of cash. I never carry cash around, but I've got a little bit of cash that's actually mine that's in here. I've got a library card because I'm a nerd. Um, and I have my Wiley library card in here. I've got a gym card in here that I never use or that I pay every month, but I've got that in here, just one of these days if I decide to wake up and go to the gym that I could use. I've got this thing called a debit card in here that I use to directly draw money out of my bank account whenever I want to go out to eat or spend time with someone and want to spend money on someone. And then I've got a bunch of these little things called credit cards in here, way more than I need, that begin to tell a different story about me that I want to spend money that I don't have to impress people that really aren't worth impressing when I actually don't have any money and when their opinion really shouldn't matter the world to me. All right, hand your wallet back. If you need to go through your wallet to make sure your license and your money is all in there, take a second, do that. My goal in doing that, and we're going to come back to the wallet here in a second, is to help you to begin to realize that we live in this tension. Something that glares its head, especially around this time of Christmas that we call Advent, waiting for Jesus to come. The tension is this place that where we're living and the freedom and the life that we could be living a completely different story than what we're living. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. This morning I want to look at Matthew 2, 1 to 8. Matthew 2, 1 to 8. It says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, And have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. See, what we're going to see in this story 
And the picture I want to paint for you this morning is two completely different kingdoms that diabolically oppose each other. We're going to see the kingdom of Herod on one side, and we're going to see the kingdom of Jesus on the other side. Let me tell you a little bit about this guy named Herod, and what, so we can get an idea of his kingdom, the kingdom of this world and what it's all about. Herod was considered the king of the Jews. That's what he was labeled by Caesar. No wonder he was troubled and perplexed when the wise men came and asked, where is this new king? In his mind, he was the king of the Jews. And he's been this king for a long, long time, all the way back to 30 BC. And Herod was an amazing builder. He did stuff for the people. He built, he rebuilt the second temple. And the temple is now the epicenter of the city of Jerusalem. And he calls it Herod's temple. He renamed it after himself. He was communicating to the people, this is about me. I am your king, and when you worship, you're going to worship in a place that's titled after me. I'm going to give you what you need. And then he builds aqueducts to supply water into Jerusalem. So he was the epicenter of their religious life, the Herod's temple, but then he was also responsible to give them what they needed so they could survive physically. He made cities. He made buildings. He was a wealthy king who lived a life of luxury, and that was often at the expense of others. See, in the first century, there was this small upper class, but there was this huge lower class. And to buy off the people that he needed to buy off, he had to take from the lower class to live this life of luxury that he lived. See, but Herod was also an insecure leader. He used murder of getting what he wanted. He outlawed any public gatherings in the city because if he saw people talking together in groups, he was always afraid that they were talking about him. He would murder, murder wives, family members, and priests. He would do what he needed to do so that he could stay in charge. The dude had 10 wives. He only loved one of them, and he ended up murdering her for the same reason. He killed his mother-in-law. Caesar Augustus would used to joke in Rome, I would rather be Herod's pig than his son. It was a sad but true statement. See, Herod was this moderately practicing Jew. He would never butcher a non-kosher pig, but he actually had two of his sons executed. Why? Because Herod wanted to be in charge. It was always about more for him. And he always felt threatened in his life. And see, if you keep reading the story, you discover that when these wise men show up and ask him where the king of the Jews are, is, it triggers a series of events where Herod actually murders all baby boys under the age of two in Bethlehem. It's an effort of Herod to hang on to his stuff. This is how ruthless this man is. He tried to snuff out baby Jesus before he could ever grow up but it didn't work. What are the words that describe Herod? For me, words come to mind like power. If you were in the first century and you knew of King Herod, you would immediately say greatness. Other words, fear, pride, things, stuff, luxury. If you keep reading, you discover a completely ki different kingdom. Verse 4 says, Herod, assembling all of the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, O you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and learned from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring him, bring me word, so that I too may come and worship. Let's get this straight. Herod had no intention of worshiping Jesus. He was wanting to actually deal with him, just like he dealt with everyone else in his life, and get him out of the way. 
Think with me a little bit what this new kingdom of Jesus is going to be all about. He comes in a completely different way than Herod's kingdom. This whole birth of Jesus gives us an early glimpse into what God's kingdom is really all about. Jesus comes in fulfilling prophecy. The prophecy that we read there is from Micah chapter 5, where out of Bethlehem the king of all kings would come. See, this is a God thing. This has been talked about, looked forward to. The high priest who knew scripture said, this is what the star was pointing to. The king of Jews is going to be born in the city of David, the city of Bethlehem. Jesus had to be connected to David. It's intriguing. If you understand correctly, Bethlehem was only about a two to three mile walk from Herod's temple. So right next door to where Herod lives in luxury and glamour and splendor, in a place of luxury, in a place where he demands fear and allegiance, right next door is born a king who can't even get room in a hotel. Our rebel God slips quietly into the story. Under the evil empire of Rome, under the nose of this tyrant king, he's born into poverty. He's born in a small little town, and little by little he begins to change things. And it wasn't by force. It wasn't by threat. He didn't have to kill family members. He didn't kick the front door in. He slips quietly into history. And he starts the revolution of grace. And when you look at the story and when you look at the Christmas narrative, it's a revolution that we see here. This is a really subversive stuff that's going on in this story. And I want you to pay attention to what verse 6 says, the prophecy says. For you... For from you shall come a ruler, that sounds powerful, who will shepherd my people Israel. This ruler who's supposed to be all-powerful will shepherd my people Israel. The purpose of this king, the purpose of Jesus, is going to be so different from Herod. That word shepherd there is the idea of pastoring. It's to care for to provide. It's have the best interest of others in mind over your own interest. So where are the words that come to mind when you think about the kingdom of Jesus? Poverty. Humility. Caring. Love. Surprise. This is one of those things that takes you back this is how you're going to bring a king in that's actually going to defeat Herod and establish his throne in Jerusalem? This is how you're going to do it? And as we listen to these two different kingdoms, I can't help but think what it says to the world in which we live in. Let me throw out a few thoughts for you. See, like Herod's kingdom and like the kingdoms of this world, I think we often misplace what it's all about. We often misplace what this is all about. The real king of the Jews is the one who comes as a baby, the one who came toward us, the one who came to shepherd, to care for, to provide, to protect, to have our best, best interest in mind, ultimately to die for those who he would shepherd and rule. We often misplace or misunderstand what this is all about. And like Herod's kingdom and the kingdoms of this world, I think we often worship the consumerism. We often desire more and more and more and more. It's so hard to get out of that. It is sometimes it begins to sort of build something inside of us. We see this played out in our lives when we don't get what we want, when we see it. When someone takes something that we think belongs to us, we lose it. You don't believe me? Watch all the YouTube videos from Black Friday. Watch all those crazy freaks fighting over stuff, over possessions that will probably break in less than six months. We want more, and we want more, and we want more, and when we don't get it, we lose it like Herod's kingdom and the kingdoms of this world, 
oftentimes we want to amass more at the expense of other people. It could be child labor. It could be our friends. It could be at the expense of our marriages. It could be the expense of time that we could give to others, but we're too busy trying to amass more for ourselves. But like Herod's kingdom, we can buy into this idea that getting more and getting more is what it's all about, even if it means we lose everyone around us. Listen to this. This past year, $17 billion was spent on makeup. $17 $17 billion. I could talk about technology or sports, but that would make me uncomfortable, and I don't wear makeup, so we'll talk about makeup this morning. $17 billion on makeup. And I'm not saying makeup is bad. Don't, get me, don't misunderstand me. $17 billion. Consider these stats I found on AdventConspiracy.org. $10 billion would cure all the water crisis in the world. All of it. Ten billion. That's all it would take. Nineteen billion dollars would give food to every person in this world. Five billion. You could build schools to teach every child in this world to read. Again, I'm not saying that makeup is bad, but I think sometimes we get so focused on what we want that it's often at the expense of others. The point of this is this, and listen to this. If you walk away from here, and I know that I'm coming to you from a negative place, but if you walk away from something this morning, this is what I want it to be. The kingdoms of this world will demand your devotion at the risk of your soul. The kingdoms of this world will demand your devotion and your worship at the risk of your souls. 13 million Americans right now are still paying off credit card debt that they acquired last Christmas. The kingdoms of this world will demand your devotion, your worship, your time, your money at the risk of your soul. When you look at your own life, are there a lot of different things that are demanding your allegiance, saying, This will bring me true happiness. This will bring me true joy. Or if I get this, or if I get that, then I will ultimately be content. I'm asking you, what if this year, what if we rebelled against that? What if we said no to that? You're being inundated with texts and print ads and radio ads and promotions on your Facebook page and advertisements on TV, you're being flooded with this message that says, if you really want to be happy, then buy your kids this, and buy your spouse this, and buy this for yourself, and if you buy this, then you will be happy. See, but I think as we look at the Christmas story, as we look at the Christmas narrative, and we look at Jesus being born in this world, I think there is a completely different story. See, the kingdom of Jesus does a completely different thing for us. Number one, it saves our souls by grace and humility. By who Jesus is and what he has done, it saves our souls. And by grace, secondly, it gives us a completely different story to live into. See, this is where it gets so hopeful for me because that whole negative place I spent on for the beginning half of this message, if that's all there is, then I can say forget it. But this story of Jesus invites us, the birth of Jesus invites us into a completely different story. So instead of spending $450 billion at Christmas this season, that's an average of about $1,000 per person. And I know that's not true of everyone, but that's a lot of money. Instead of that, what if we move to a different place? What if we talked about the practicality of spending less? So let me give you a challenge, and this is going to be very practical, and you can take it or you can leave it. It's totally up to you. But that amount of money that you've budgeted for Christmas this year, and hopefully you budgeted some amount for Christmas so you're not in crazy debt, maybe it's $1,000 for some of you, or it's 500 or it's 100 or 250 whatever it is. What if 
you decided that this year you're just going to spend 10% less. You're just going to spend 10% less than what you thought you would spend. So instead of spending $1,000, you actually decided you're going to spend 900 Instead of spending 500 you decided I'm going to spend 450 this year. Instead of spending 100 you decided I'm just going to spend 90 And here's my challenge to you with that 10%. What if we take that 10%? And we say 5% of that, we're going to give it to someone or something that has a need that can make a difference in this world. Maybe it's blessing this family that we want to bless with, and that could be it. And if that's not where God's leading you, that's fine. But maybe it's an organization that's working hard to make a difference in our world. One of the organizations that our family supports is a ministry called Bombay Teen Challenge. They work in the heart of the red light district in Mumbai, and we got to spend a couple of days with them this summer. And some of you ladies who are here this summer got some stuff that the ladies made there. But they go into the heart of Mumbai and rescue women off the streets. They rescue their children. They built a school that we got to spend a day at. And we got to see kids that were rescued off the streets. Maybe it's giving towards something like that that says, these guys are making a difference and giving hope to people that otherwise would have no hope. Maybe it's just giving to the local Salvation Army or a homeless shelter. But what if you said, 5% of what I'm deciding not to spend on, I'm going to use that to bless somewhere where people's lives are being changed, where people's lives are being impacted. And what if the other 5%, you take it and say, God, who individually can I bless this year? Who can I just love on? And I'm not talking about family members unless you have some family member that you're not connected with. But God, who would you lay on my heart that maybe with this 5% that I have, I can take them out for lunch? Maybe with this 5%, I can surprise them with a gift. Or maybe I can do something nice for this individual or this family that you lay on my heart. Listen, I'm not asking you to take that 10% and give it to church. I'm asking you to take that 10% and say, use it in a way that people's lives are changed. Use it in a way that lives matter. It's not about stuff. See, I pray that as we tell the Christmas story by the way that we actually live and by the way that we spend our resources. My prayer is that when you get in the car this morning, you would begin this conversation with your family, that you would begin to ask Jesus how you could live differently this Christmas season. The kingdom of this world demands your devotion and your worship, and it's killing you. But the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of God, is brought in by a baby child born in Bethlehem in a manger. It gives me life and teaches me a brand new way of living. This is what spending less is all about. Listen, we don't need to live in a kingdom of more. Listen to me, Christmas is more than just about stuff. If that's the only thing you're excited about this Christmas season, you're missing it. Because the stuff you get, it'll be broken in six to nine months. And you'll be discontented and you will want more. And you'll never be satisfied. There is something beautiful and helpful that could be brewing in this conspiracy that I'm talking about. What if we stood for something? This isn't about doing something out of guilt or anger or disgust to say that buying stuff is bad. That's not what I'm communicating. This is about a better way. This is about not just saying no to the way that we normally do Christmas. It's really about saying yes to a better way, a more beautiful way, a more meaningful way. So let's say yes to some things this Christmas season. Let's say yes to the things that matter. Let's say yes to what's real. Let's say yes to what lasts. Let's say yes to Jesus. Let's say yes to the gifts that God has given to us. Let's look around and pay attention to those people in our lives that not, might not be there in a few years, and let's say yes to them. Let's be a people as we leave here that we will live and we will laugh and we will celebrate and we will live differently because Jesus calls us to live differently. But we won't do it out of pride. With quiet humility and gratitude, you will share the story of how our rebel God enters our story and turns our life upside down. 
And we will live that story out as we go through these next few weeks when you hear the words, Jesus, when you hear the word Bethlehem, when you hear the word Herod, when you hear the word Caesar, may you remember that something is stirring, a conspiracy is happening. May you remember that a rebel God slipped into the story when no one was looking and a conspiracy happened and the world has been drastically changed forever. That You have a liberating king who comes to make things right. May that be your motivation for Christmas this season. Here's my prayer for you. Here's my prayer. That whether you get a little or whether you get a lot, and whether you give a little or whether you give a lot, my prayer is there will come a moment on that Christmas morning. Maybe it's before everyone else wakes up and you just have a few moments Maybe it's before, maybe it's after all of the craziness of the day and unwrapping all the gifts. Maybe it's in the midst of all of the craziness. But sometime that morning, my prayer is that you would kneel down and you would declare that Jesus is God. Not stuff, not money, not possessions, not all this stuff, but Jesus is my God. That he is who I bow to. That he is who I worship. That he is the reason for this season. My prayer is that we would be people who would be so consumed by Jesus and what he has done for us that it would overflow from our lives it would make a difference in the community that we live in. That we would be people that because Jesus loved us, we would begin to love differently. We would begin to act differently. We would begin to behave differently. That as for me and my house, we will bow to Jesus. We will bow only to Jesus. We will not worship the stuff. The stuff is good. But our allegiance and our worship is to him. This morning, that's something I can say yes to. And maybe for some of you, that's something that you can say yes to this morning that you would say, it's not about what I get, it's not about what I give. But that this season, it would only be about Jesus.